Hello and welcome to the round so far, brought to you by Amy. I'm Riley Beveridge. This is Kane Corns. Kane, a dramatic weekend of footy. We'll start at the MCG, our big story. Collingwood, they did it again against Adelaide. Could you believe it? So let's look at some of these last quarter moments. Isaac Rankin was enormous in the last quarter. He had five clearances, including that goal. We'll get to more of him shortly, but let's have another look at that. Mercurial around goals, having a huge season, but unfortunately has done his hammy. Great smother there with 2.44 left from Quainer. He gets it back, and fortunately for the Pies, the ball hand lands in the hands of guess who? Nick Dacos, who was unbelievable once again, making some sort of charge toward the Brownlow medal. Really poor defending there, late from Keane to go. He kicks this with two minutes to go. And the Pies hold on again mm. and win another close one against the Adelaide Football Club, who would be shattered after dropping that game today. You mentioned another close one. Have a look at this. This is the last four times Collingwood's played Adelaide. Four points, two points, one point, five points. Five of the last six wins that Collingwood's amassed against the Crows have been by under a kick. Yeah, they'd be disappointed because they conceded six consecutive goals early on in the game. And I just thought right from the start they were off and they mm. got smashed in the midfield. So we'll get to Pendlebury shortly. But Nick Dacos, Josh Dacos, Pendlebury to go, all yep. huge numbers. Noble had a huge game. But right from the first quarter, it was their midfield that got on top. And that was the difference in the game, really. Mm. The start and then conceding those six in a row. Other than that, plus seven entries in the last quarter for the Crows. Yep. Felt like they were going to overrun them. And at some point they were. Were, but once again, Collingwood just know what to do in those close games late. Let's get to our moment now because it was a controversial one. Isaac Rankin pinged for running too far with the footy. You can see just 20 seconds on the clock. He takes the bounce there. Now the count is out, Kane. I reckon he took 14 steps, but the rule is you must bounce or touch the football on the ground at least once every 15 metres. The steps doesn't matter, irrespective of whether such player is running in a straight line or otherwise. So you can see there, 24.2 metres. Jeezy. <laughs> You hardly ever see this pain. No, you I don't. think that's where the, the, the sort of queries come from. You don't, and, and it's particularly with 20 seconds ago in a tight game at the MCG that means so much for the Adelaide Footy Club. But the AFL will say, we got that right, the umpire mm. made the right decision. But people are losing their minds over this. They're just assuming that uh, Adelaide are going to kick a goal with yeah, 15 yeah. seconds yeah. to go. Like, even the players didn't realise that that had been called back. They're fighting it out. There's a contest. There's like 10, 15 seconds to yeah. go on the clock. And everyone's going, oh, that cost us the game. Well, mm. it didn't because you still had to kick a goal, yep. which is really struggled to do with 16 entries in the last quarter. So, yeah, if it was a free kick or not, Adelaide still had to put one through the big sticks. And I'm mm. not sure that would have happened. So can we just keep that in context as well? We certainly can. You might have seen at the end there, Isaac Rankin doing his hamstring, which is a massive blow for them. So he's going to be out for a couple of weeks. He'd have to think. He's been in such good form now. You mentioned Collingwood's midfield and it was led by Scott Penderbury, who's had such a great month of footy. Had another 30 disposals, 8 score involvement, 6 clearances and 2 goals today. Uh, his first quarter was unbelievable. Yeah. I was watching him do the warm-up and he had about 15 shots from that spot where he kicked the first goal in that game and then that one from stoppage. He's been doing that for a long time. But look, I thought he was probably done eight mm. weeks ago. I, yeah. I thought he looked done. I thought he was going to ground. I thought he was getting caught with the ball and I thought his skill level was poor. So whatever he's done to work himself way back into the season and produce this is you just got to respect it. He wants to go on, you can tell, and there's no reason that he won't go on again next year. His connection with the other midfield, particularly Nick Dacos, is uncanny. So got to put my hand up and say I was hard on him eight weeks ago, but from my eyes, mm. it looked like he was coming towards the end of an unbelievable career. But right now, you'd have to say... Uh, he's going to be a crucial factor on whether they can go back-to-back -back or not. He's enormous today. He's been superb over the last month. All right, let's get to Marvel Stadium now where Fremantle just got the job done against St Kilda. You can see there a three-point game in the last quarter, but they ran away with it. Yeah, so these are some of the big last quarter moments. It was a tussle. It was a tight one. Fremantle just could not put it through the big sticks once again. 9-18 uh, they kicked uh, today, and it was frustrating for them. But in the end, they got the run on, and they really, in the crucial moments, were able to score. I thought their midfield was enormous. They really beat St Kilda up around the stoppages, and Ross Lyon spoke about that after the game. Huge goal here from Jago O'Meara to put that one through and essentially that sealed it. But the fallout from the Saints will be significant. We spoke about them at length last week and we'll speak about them at length again today because it's just not working out yeah. the game style that Ross Lyon is trying to play. Only 55 points tonight, having kicked 53 last week against Hawthorne. After that game against the Hawks last week, Ross Lyon spoke about their offensive strategy. We're really disappointed with our offense. Um, our defense for a long period has been in good order. I think we're about sixth in the comp, but it's 
by margin to, to the others above that. So our stoppage work's improving. So yeah, we've really just drilled down on trying to establish our, our identity with the ball because um, it, you know, there was opportunity, a lot of opportunities left on the table. So that. So that's really alarming for me. We're trying to establish mm. our identity with the ball. You've done that against Hawthorne, kick 53 points. You'd think you would have worked on that all week. The players spoke about that. Brad Hill spoke about it during the week. And all you could muster was 55 points against yeah. a team under a roof that didn't play finals last year in Fremantle. They took five marks inside forward 50 to 17. Mm. So whatever he is trying to do, plus 100, 100 marks again for, for those you know, mid-40s of entries and five marks inside forward 50, it is breaking down significantly with his game plan when they've got the footy in their hands. So, yep, there's issues everywhere. There's sort of spot fires everywhere for the Saints. They're getting smashed mm. in the midfield. Their turnovers are poor. And when they've got the ball, there is no system with what to do with it. And this is another issue for them. When they do try and go fast, they are unable to execute. And we spoke about this way back with the Port Adelaide game. Like the amount of turnovers, yeah. costly ones in dangerous positions that should lead to those marks inside 50 or those scoring opportunities be really frustrating to play as a forward in this side. And no wonder they don't get a forward line winner. Owens kicked three but drifted out of the game. Max King competed hard but clearly is affected by this. 4-8 off turnover, plus 15 for Fremantle in this game of football. And Ross has got to fix it. Uh, yeah. We spoke last week about the excuses. Don't worry about the excuses. You need to come up with a game plan that works in modern football. And you've got to be able to score more than 55 points against a team under a roof that didn't play finals last year. The Dockers were plus 15 in turnover. You touched on it before as well, but they're 3-7 and seven now, the Saints. And they've only played three of last year's finalists, so they've got a tough run coming up. There was a flashpoint early in this game. Michael Frederick subbed out for the Dockers with concussion following this brutal collision with Jimmy Webster. Now, Jimmy Webster's just coming back from the seven-game suspension that he copped in pre-season for the bump on Dry Simkin. Do you think he has anything to worry about? No, there? I don't. It's an unbelievable effort from Frederick. Like, the courage shown yeah. here. You couldn't have blamed him if he didn't go for this contest, uh, contest, and we understand why, and we wouldn't have been critical of that. But Webster, if you can see, he does everything right. Mm. He's got his full focus on the ball. He makes a play for the ball with the spoil. Yep, it's unfortunate. Sometimes players get hurt in a tough game. No case to answer. He did everything right, and we, we just hope that uh, Michael was okay. Let's get to the Gabba now where Brisbane defeated Richmond by 119 points. This was an absolute smashing. Kai Lohman did a lot of the damage up forward. He kicked a career high five goals. He's shown a bit in the last month but <laughs> Brisbane's forwards had it all on their own terms. Yeah it was a field day wasn't it? I mean the, every pretty much every time or every second time they went inside forward 50 they scored. They only had 60 entries mm. and to win by 119 points and kick that biggest score off 60 entries. It says a few things. It says about Brisbane's efficiency and their ability to launch the footy in dangerous spots. They kick 16 goals from inside 30 metres. Yeah. They kick nine goals from zero to 15. So the ability to get the footy in really dangerous spots really shone. But I mean, they got some really improved players. Archie's ah, starting yeah. to have a real impact. Lohman's had a career best game tonight. So I'm liking the opportunities that some of these youngsters are getting mm. um, and there's small ones going okay as well. Yeah, there certainly is. We mentioned Scott Penderbury before, but what about Dane Zorko? He is our Saturday star today because once again, he was fantastic. 35 disposals, 15 marks, a goal, nine score involvements. It comes off winning best on ground in the Q Clash a couple of weeks ago when he had 40 as well. Yeah, he's got one of the um, unrecognised CVs or underrated CVs in the game. Five mm. best and fairest already yeah. and he's still got He could win a six best and fairest, Dane Zorko. I'm not sure who would be taking the votes off him right now. Maybe Hugh McCluggage, but certainly Lockie Neal hasn't been the Lockie Neal that he has been uh, throughout the majority of his career. Harris Andrews has probably had a good year, but he's in line to win a six best and fairest. Unbelievable. But the move to halfback, I mean, he can play everywhere. Yeah. I'm staggered teams don't go after him and put more attention into him because his ball use is elite. Nine score involvements tonight from his 30 five touches across half back and he hardly wastes them. He's really competitive and, and good one-on-one. -on -one. So um, it's been a really impressive season once again from a star of the game. What about the Tigers now? Because they're one and nine. This was their biggest loss since that game against Geelong in 2007 where they conceded 200 plus points all the way. It was what, 15, 16, 17 years ago. The percentage has dipped under 60 now. It's starting to get really concerning. We know about their injury worries. They had another couple today. McKelty LaFowle went off with a jaw injury. Ryan Mansell went off with what looked like concussion as well. 
There's nothing going right. No, him. there's not. And you sort of get what you wish for. Like last week, Adam Muzo, I, I nearly fell over when he said I couldn't fault the effort after what I saw because there was no effort. I sort of sat here last week and thought they've checked out. And I said mm. it's a, a really long way in the season to go and you've checked out already. So the concern was there. And then Adam Muzo, rather than be really hard and set the standards that he wants, says I can't fault the effort. So no wonder they turn up thinking that that, that effort last week was OK and mm. you produce it again tonight and concede the first 10 goals of the game. He's got to make a statement with his team. He's got to set his standards on this team. He's got to make sure the players know if it's like last week and if it's like tonight. But what, what aren't, do you do though? Because there's good enough. There's, he's, he can't do anything from the selection table. I understand, but when you speak to the media, you're speaking to your players. For yeah. him to get up there last week and say, I can't fault our effort, the players drive home and go, oh, okay, the coach is okay. Yeah, he's right. happy with the yeah. effort that we've shown. We'll just produce that again. You produce it again, you can see 10 goals, you know, the first 10 goals in the game. So, He's got to set a harder standard with this group. Otherwise, in two years, he'll get chewed up and spat out and the next coach will come in because Richmond fans and the club, a proud club like that, aren't going to cop efforts like that two weeks in a row. Let's get to NG Stadium now where the Western Bulldogs got a really important win over the Giants. And you want to put this on the radar, Kane. They just moved the ball so easily out of their defensive half. I was really disappointed with the lack of forward pressure from the Giants. Now, they have played a tall forward line for the majority of the year. Now, Brown's not there, but uh, it has been those four tall forwards. But it's a bit of a concern with the ease, particularly in wet conditions, that the Bulldogs were able to transition the ball out of the Giants' forward half. Now, they didn't get enough opportunities to go inside 50. Like, it was minus 19 in entries today, which isn't going to cut it. But Riccardi and Cadman, uncompetitive today. So Riccardi's got to go back and play some VFL football. He's had five, six, five, six touches in the last month. Riccardi was off tonight. So I just think we've got to get back to seeing the ferocity of those small forwards. Yeah. That was the hallmark of their game. Um, locking the ball inside forward 50 and not letting the opposition transition. And then on the flip side, just thought they had real struggles moving the football out of their defensive half. It was a really frustrated Giants coach Adam Kingsley throughout the game. Here's, here's, here's him speaking after the match. Yeah, it's really frustrating and it's something we continue to work on, but we're not quite yet fixed. Um, you know, we're a little bit unreliable with some some aspects of our game at the moment and contest is certainly one of them. And um, and even game, you know, within games, we're having really good moments, uh, but we're unable to sustain that for long enough, uh, as long as the opposition. Yeah, I think he's just got to be a little bit careful with his body language. When, yeah. when you're on the interchange bench there, you've got to really be positive. And that was something that he probably struggled with in the first six or seven games of his career. So if he's there, he's got to be upbeat. He's got to be not showing that frustration like he was today. And I understand why, because there's the record yeah. recently after being undefeated after the first five games. And yeah, they've dropped off significantly. I'm not ready to, to write them off. I think they're incredibly mm. well coached. I think they're well led by Toby Green, who had a really good game today and kicked half their score. But it's starting to get concerning. Yeah, it Huge is. game down in Geelong next week against the Cats before they have a much-needed buy. Only one win in their last five games. And the game before that as well, they only just hung on against St Kilda. All right, let's get to our Amy Clangers now. And we'll start at NG Stadium because... When things are going wrong, what you don't want is one of your best players, Cal Ward, kicking it the wrong way and setting no. up a goal for his former side. Over 300 <laughs> games now for Cal Ward, he kicked it the wrong way in a tight. And he, I, I lip read that and he said, I've never done that before. <laughs> no, you haven't. And there's the coach once again. No wonder he was frustrated. Poor old Grind. Yeah. Thought he was one of their better players on Thursday night. There wasn't many of them, but he didn't need that in the face, nor did Matty Johnson. No, he's copped one there. We think it's Chapman, who's yep. the, the culprit here, coming in late, getting him in the eye, but. That was after the winning goal for the Dockers. All right, let's get to the SCG now. Friday night footy where Chad Warner ran rampant against Carlton. He was fantastic throughout this game. 28 disposals, 14 score involvements and three goals. Oh, he's so watchable. Is he the most watchable player right now in the game? I think yeah. he is. I mean, he's just at the peak of his powers. He's almost taking the mickey with the opposition. Look at this centre bounce goal. Now, he doesn't have the same running style as Chris Judd, but there's a lot of what he does that reminds me of what Chris Judd was doing at West Coast, where he's just looking at opponents that are chasing him, watch this, and bouncing when they're right on his hammer, and like, you are not going to catch me. He's almost this. laughing there. He, he is, like there's a, there's a genuine uh, power and speed that only the best have. We probably saw it with Isaac mm. Rankin today. We certainly see it with Nick Blakey, but it's a joy to watch. I mean, he's making the game look beautiful, and I mean, they're going to be really hard to beat. Long way to go in the season. Yeah. 
what a coach John Longmire is with what he's done. He's making the players earn it at selection. He's identifying the game's best players from the opposition and nullifying them, which we'll get to. And then he's got some young midfield stars that yeah. are absolutely taking the mickey. And uh, they're a force at the moment, the Swans. They certainly are. And they've found role players as well. It's not just about the stars. James Jordan, he shut down Lockie Whitfield a couple of weeks ago. Jordan Clark, he had the role on Sam Walsh. He was incredibly physical with him at every opportunity he could find. Yeah, what about the numbers for Walsh since he's come back into the side after that injury? He was basically 35 every week for Sam Walsh. Well, he has about 20, and 20 hard-fought scrapping ones. So this is the absolute perfect technique for a run-with player. Notice how he never gets Walsh let him get behind him. He has him in his sights at all times. So even if Walsh gets the footy, he's right there to tackle him. Watch, he just takes back shoulder right here. If Walsh then gets the footy, he's all over him. And that means that you can't have an effective disposal. So if you're a run with player, even Walsh is saying there, he's holding on, get me a free kick, please. He's just getting some attention for the first time. Right behind, back shoulder. If Walsh gets it, he can grab it or he can win the clearance himself. So perfectly done with that technique. And I just staggered that more teams don't actually try and nullify the opposition's best. If it's good enough for John Longmire, yeah. it's good enough for some of the other coaches to try and do that to the opposition's best. I reckon we've praised over the last couple of years Carlton's decision to throw Charlie Kerno behind the ball in pivotal moments. What do you reckon about this? This one confused me. So there's five minutes to go in the second quarter here. It's a two-goal game, and he goes back and spends the entirety of the last five minutes behind the ball. Carlton had repeat entry after repeat entry after repeat entry. They locked the ball in their front half. And their best forward is standing 60 the metres behind the footy. So if you look here, they get the entry inside 50. Who do you want to be kicking to? You want to be kicking to your best foot forward, and he should be there. Instead, he's not impacting the play. He's 60 metres behind the ball. They missed the chance to close the gap to a goal just before half-time. And he spent the entirety of the last yeah, five minutes no, behind the ball. It was a great pick-up from you. And I'm OK with him doing it late in games, yeah. maybe the last two minutes Must when you're trying to protect the lead. And he's pretty good at it. And he's done that before. But when the game's on the line, when seasons are on the line, when top four's on the line and you've got the ball locked in, you've got to have your best mm. and the Coleman medal favourite in the forward 50. Because he, he looked dangerous on the night as well. Yeah. All right, let's get to Thursday night footy up in Darwin where Gold Coast recorded... Probably one of their greatest wins in club history over the Cats. 64-point winners, and they moved the ball so well through the middle. Yeah, that, that was the thing for me. So it was a, a game plan that I thought was risky in the conditions, but they took 33 marks in the first quarter, and they were chipping it around, making Geelong defend. And then in fast play, their handball chains were just elite. Now, there is a lack of pressure from Geelong. You see bows there just get run around, and, and the effort clearly wasn't there. They've won six straight in Darwin. They love it up there. The forward handball, the run, the carry, the run from behind, and then the shifting off the line with hands. And even players like Rao were able to get involved and influence the scoreboard like that. So career nights across the board, career night for Rao, career night for Anderson, mm. career night for Humphrey, career night in terms of scoring for Gold Coast. Um, and there is where they sit. Yeah as opposed to their seasons before, and that shows they're in the best position they've ever been in. Yes, yeah, so they're six and four now. This is when there have been two wins clear of losses on the ledger. So six and four, it's only the second time in their history this has happened after round four. That time back in 2014, of course, that was right when Gary Ablett got injured and their season went off the rails, second half of the campaign. But you'd think they should maybe be playing finals. 100%, you know, they, 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 well, they shouldn't really miss from here. That, yeah. that was the win that you needed to see against a good side because the teams that they had beaten had been the ones at the lower end of the ladder. They've got a favourable draw and um, with tactics like they've shown against you know, the likes of Tom Stewart, even though Geelong's defence uh, defense was really poor, the Gold Coast made them pay significantly. But I did love uh, Long on Stewart yeah. after McEntee on Stewart, which we spoke about last week. And he did it really well, keeping uh, Tom Stewart to zero marks for only the third time in his career. Yeah, and it was a weird night for the Cats as well, because as you mentioned there, Tom Stewart doesn't take a mark for the third time in his career. I think the first two he got injured as well. So this is the first full game he played without taking one. But just turnovers, lackadaisical on defence. Watch this. this is, watch the effort here. Every Geelong player, even Atkins, who's usually a terrier, just stops. Guthrie gets run around for an easy walking goal from the goal square. So I haven't seen this from Geelong. I'm just wondering how concerning this is. Like, look, look, to not close that space there. That is your defensive 50, not your forward 50. Mm. So... The lack of defense, which they've been so strong here. Look at the space here once again for Long inside forward 50. So that leg rope that he's given there, too much. And that's yeah. very un -Geelong like So you've got a couple of options here. You completely write it off if you're Chris Scott. And you yeah. say, okay, no Cameron, no Hawkins. Yeah. 
A um, couple of the others, no De Koning, mm. uh, was there, rested them. And that's it, you scrap it, or you really review it hard. I suspect that you do the latter. I think you really review that yeah. hard um, because it's a bit of a warning. Um, they were really off. I think you have to, considering as well, no wits, no Walter. The Gold Coast made changes as well. Five-day break in hot conditions up in Darwin. All right, let's get to the rest of the round now. Plenty of footy still to come on Sunday. Essendon takes on North Melbourne at Marvel Stadium. They're flying at the moment, the Bombers. Port Adelaide going by Yarda Pulte, one of a number of clubs using their Indigenous name this weekend. They play Hawthorne, and then West Coast takes on Melbourne to finish off the round. Kane, anything tickle your fancy there? Um, no, they're pretty straightforward. The results mm. should be as we think they are going to go with all you never the favourites. And though. they are a lot of favourite heavenly, all three sides. So we'll see how that goes. But um, I've been surprised before. Have been, certainly. Thanks for your time tonight, Kane. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.